How are you? I'm good. Long time. I know. It's so great to see you. <clears throat> you holding up? Pretty good. How are yeah. you doing? Hey, How's everybody? Virtual? Oh, sorry. I talked over you, Kim. It's okay. Is that you, Lee? It is. I'm invisible for the moment. Uh, uh, and we actually have a couple of Texas librarians joining us here. Oh, wonderful. That's great. So, folks, we can make this pretty informal. Um, hey, they're coming, they're coming. Um, if you would like to type a question into the chat, you can do so uh, in the chat screen in Zoom. If there's folks watching in the booth, uh, hello and welcome there. Um, and we have Ingrid, my colleague from IDW Publishing, joining us as well. Hey, Ingrid. Hello. Um, she, she has been uh, monitoring the booth all day. And we've got uh, some folks from around Texas. If you want to uh, type into the chat uh, where you're from and uh, what community you're representing, what library, et cetera, we'd love to hear that. Um, and I would love, uh, Kim and Jerry, we haven't uh, tested this. I can do a screen share, and you might also be able to. Uh, if you ever want to pull up any particular page or scene to talk about any particular point that comes up in the conversation. Um, so feel free to give that a shot. Um, or if I've got it on hand, I may I might pop it up if it seems relevant. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, maybe you guys can just get started by um, introducing yourself. Where are you? Uh, what do you do and uh, talk about your uh, graphic novels? That sounds great. Go for it, Jared. You want me to go first? Yes. Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, my name is Jared Rosello. I'm a cartoonist and a teacher um, and, a, and a literacies researcher also. And I'm based in Tampa, Florida. Um, I teach at the University of South Florida in the creative writing program. So I teach comics and cartooning. Um, and then I do uh, literacies research with children, which actually comes to inform a lot of my children's graphic novels. So usually it's after working with kids for a while that I start to get an idea for a story <clears throat> um, and just sort of draw on their inspiration of the ways in which children are thinking about what's possible in the world and how narrative works for them. And so, um, so I find that to be a great source of inspiration for my stories. All right, I'll take over from here. Hi, I'm Kim Dwinell. I'm here in Long Beach, California. Um, I am also uh, a professor. At, at, I, I teach animation at Cal State Long Beach, and I, I worked in animation for about 10 years. Um, and I kind of see graphic novels as like a progression. It's like an animated film in a book. So that's how I came at this. Um, uh, Jared says he's informed a lot by his kiddos and I'm informed a lot by being out in the ocean. I am definitely a beach girl and a surfer and a kayaker and I have a boat. And so surrounded by water here in Long Beach, that's where I draw a lot of my inspiration. Terrific. Um, well, can you introduce your uh, book series that you're uh, here, your middle grade graphic novels published by Top Shelf IDW? <laughs> Should we get to that? You want me to start, yeah. Jared? They're right here. So sure. I, <laughs> I write and illustrate a series called Surfside Girls. Um, the first book, The Secret of Danger Point, came out in 2017. And uh, the second book in the series came out in 2019. This is The Mystery at the Old Rancho. Um, really, really dive into California history for both of these. Um, they're like Nancy Drew at the beach, and they're really fun, like, preteen sleuths solving mysteries in their beach town, but there's like a lot of deeper historical context underneath all of it. And my um, third book in this, well, sort of in the series is coming out this June or July. I don't know, Lee, you could probably tell me more, but yep, it's July. It's July. Uh, it's a companion book to this called The Science of Surfing. And so it it's narrated by my two tweens, Sam and Jade, and, uh, and a little bit of little brother Pete who comes in with annoying ocean themed jokes. Um, but I like I, I um, love Tony D. Terlizzi's uh, Spiderwick Chronicles field guide. And I got that and I thought I would love to be able to do something like this as a companion book to my series that's nonfiction about, you know, 
the science of the ocean. So that's where that came from. Jared. So my book series is uh, Red Panda and Moon Bear. It's about these two Cuban American siblings who are growing up in the town of Marti, which is sort of like a it's a kind of borderlands uh, city. It takes place in something like a kind of Miami. Um, and so the, the kids are sort of second generation and they've got these magic hoodies and they fight monsters and solve mysteries. They're the sort of defenders of their neighborhood. Uh, but things start getting unusual and strange. Uh, usually it's, it's, it's always been, you know, it's finding lost animals or stopping neighborhood bullies, but suddenly monsters are showing up and buildings start to disappear and strange things are going on. Um, and, uh, uh, and so they become sort of these larger than life superhero kids who uh, the neighborhood kind of relies on to help solve some of the mysteries. I was actually thinking just now as you were talking Kim, that some some overlaps are that setting. I think setting is very important in both of our books. Um, Absolutely, the, the characters are so deeply involved in their communities and in their settings, um, and that's also the same in, in Red Panda and Moon Bear. And so this is the first book which came out in July of 2019, and the second book which I am almost done with, uh, I'll be done with it in the next couple of months, is due out in January of 2022, and it's called The Curse of the Evil Eye, and so it centers around mal de ojo, which in sort of Cuban culture is this kind of jealousy or envy-based curse that people can put on you, and so um, there is a sort of monstrous, potentially physical manifestation of the evil eye running around town causing a lot of trouble, and so the and kids Jared, are going to have can, can I just say that, like, your color palette is so fantastic, and, you know, I got to go to Miami for the Miami Book Fair a while back, and I'd never been to Miami, and the colors, you know, as an artist, like, the colors are so amazing, and I think you, you kind of nail it with your color palette. I adore your. Oh, music. thank you, thanks. I'm always I, one of the. I, re, I remember when we, when we, when this book was first coming out. I asked if I could color because I'm colorblind, and so I asked, <laughs> "Can I color this book?" And uh, and Lee, you and Chris were both very like, "Sure, why don't you give us a sample?" But my strategy was just to pick colors I liked and stick them together. And so I don't really know what any of the colors are that I used, <laughs> but but I do get complimented a lot on the colors I've chosen for it. So I think there's something to, I think working illogically is a part of my process all around in storytelling and character design and apparently also in color selection so I was gonna say like just going back through your book which um I, I had to actually grab the pdf because my nieces won't give it back um <laughs> you do you you like you write nonsense which makes total sense in the kid world and I don't know how you do that <laughs> well I you know, well, and this is where like working and spending a lot of time with young kids has been really helpful for me because I think as adults we tend to think in terms of like okay what is sort of logically what should progress in this story and in this narrative and we think of causality as being um, sort of logically constructed but kids think of causality as being a site of possibility whatever is possible could be could be caused to happen and so I, I tried to think of like how could I pivot this story at any point in any direction um, based off of some tiny little bit of, of, of visual information or story beat or something like that. But I always want to go in a kind of um, in a direction that opens or unfolds the, the world rather than collapses it or explains it. And so, like, 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 for instance, like your, your character goes home at night and just invents a key that opens anything. Right. Because like what kid couldn't do that? And, you know, on, on, in my books, I work so hard the opposite because I plant seeds and clues and they have the journal of weird and they're they're very logically and systematically jade is like the science brain and sam is this sort of uh emotional intuitive and the two of them work together like like Mulder and scully but um but i i work really hard to plant these logical clues you know and red herrings and try to get us there and then you're like or a magic key <laughs> yeah. well and i wonder awesome. too if that's do you think that's part of your the genre because you are always your kids are always kind of solving a mystery and I do think that mysteries are satisfying because they do tie threads together in the end and so do you think that's part of just that genre that you're working in? You know I got my Nancy Drew at the beach and I read so much Nancy Drew for sure um, yeah so this is Sam and Jade this is Sam and Jade and and they like I said they narrate this new book so while I'm trying to explain some really difficult like I let me back up a second and say that, you know, COVID has been really hard on everyone and everything and all aspects, you know, on moms, on schools and whatever. But I was really happy to have this book because 
I dug into so much amazing science research and I approached it from like if I was 11 or 12 and how would I explain this? And it was really fun to have this uh, to dig into, you know, all the, I watched a lot of uh, ocean videos and for biology sections and like moon cycles and all these things I was trying to, um, you know, try to explain, but through these snarky 12 year old voices. Um, so yeah, I was really happy to have this during COVID. Kim, I was going to say, uh, as you were talking about the, the sort of creative logical leaps and, and lack of logic and, and the fun of that in Jared's book, that you're pivoting with the, the new Surfside Girls book to be super logic based and science based and, you know, taking these girls from the sort of fantasy world uh, that that they'd been in in the previous adventures uh, and preserving some elements of that, but then pivoting to science and technology and and physics and biology and absolutely uh, can, I, can i screen share a little yeah, bit talk about that. sure yeah let me i shot. cannot screen share okay I, I can screen share now hang on a second um yeah i have a couple um things that i grabbed hang on a second um let me open them first uh just to show because um i think a person would say like how on earth are you pulling this off and what does this look like so let me let me open these real quick um, and then I'll screen share and show you. Folks, if you're just joining us, we're talking to Kim Dwinell and Jared Rossello uh, about their middle grade graphic novels published by Top Shelf. Uh, Kim's new book is called The Science of Surfing, A Surfside Girl's Guide to the Ocean. So I don't know, can you see this? Yep. Okay, so like this is Sam and Jade and they, they, um, they're learning about tides, you know, and so uh, so we know the ocean is super active and it goes up and down twice a day, but what makes it move? And the answer is the moon. And they're like, what, really? And, and so um, I, I'm trying to show this sort of thing. You know, you know, we are part of nature. We are nature, right? And as a surfer and you're out in the ocean all the time, like there is nature, just like if you were a hiker or you were, you know, you were someone who was a fisherman. When you're out in it all the time, you realize how much we are tied to nature. And I think you can lose that. So just the fact that like pointing out the, the um, cycles of the moon and what is that doing uh, for planting? What is that doing to your tides? And if there's a swell and there's a high tide because the moon is new, you know, why is the new moon causing these things and, and how this affects your daily life? And I feel like there's something really nice about the ownership of that. When we, when we who are out in nature start to go like, oh, I get this now. And this affects me because I'm, you know, I am a, um, I'm a human in nature. Absolutely. I mean, Jared, your characters are uh, taking place in a world and there are sort of rules and, and laws in ways in which they are affected by phenomena outside of them. In some cases, it's a little bit more metaphorical or a little bit more magical, you know, like I think there's a scene in the new book where the clouds are fighting uh, and it becomes this wonderful metaphor for readers to to think about you know what happens when your parents do fight and there's a kid who's sort of stuck in the middle feeling abandoned do you want to talk about how that sort of pervades the the, the magic i don't know if magical realism is a term that you like to use but talk about that some yeah yeah i think um uh magic is a big part of of Red Panda and Moon Bear. And it's not magic in necessarily spell casting, although one of the characters, Moon Bear, does sort of cast kind of spells. But the, the real magic, and I think the magic of magical realism is not just sort of spell casting necessarily, but that there are um, sort of the boundaries between what's possible and what's not possible are fluid. And so things that are not possible can just sort of appear or manifest um, in the world. And so, um, so it might be things like, the kids, you know, Red Panda and Moon Bear's parents are arguing. And so they walk outside and the world is very cloudy outside. And so it's this idea of the metaphor kind of manifesting, but then the clouds are themselves. That's the great thing about comics is that a visual metaphor is also always actual. And so the clouds are not just a, a manifestation of this metaphor, but also themselves actual clouds who are then arguing. And there's a kid cloud like Red Panda and Moon Bear who's feeling some of the similar things that they can. And so it gives Red Panda and Moon Bear an opportunity to address their, what they're feeling, but externally and in, in, 
in, in aid of someone else, which is sort of what really motivates them. Um, and so there's magic sort of functioning at all levels in that way, in that things that are not possible suddenly become possible. Um, and part of the trick of this magic is that it's not explained because as soon as you start to explain how the magic works, um, then it stops being um, magical realism in this way, it stops. And, and so the idea is that these things are possible and we don't question in the books, it's never a question of whether, there's never an existential question of why is this existing? We only respond to it, um, but everything is everything exists and is justified in its existence. And so one of the examples I like to give kids is that if you walked outside your house and there was a bear in front of you, you would be scared maybe that there was a bear, but you wouldn't be surprised that bears exist. And so that's the same kind of magic in Red Panda and Moon Bear. Nobody's ever surprised that these things exist. They just respond to it in its own sort of at face value. Um, and so that comes to sort of dictate, but then that opens up and asks questions about what's possible, which has a sort of reverse effect on me as a creator, because then I start thinking about, you know, it, it sort of shakes me loose from that logic and that linearity, because now I start to think, well, what is possible or what could be possible or what would happen if all of a sudden these clouds appeared? Um, and so here are some pencil sketch versions of the clouds. These are, uh, that uh, the two rulers of the cloud kingdom are getting a divorce and they've been arguing a lot. And so their cloud kid has actually run away from home and is hiding out in the town of Mardi. And so Red Panda and Moon Bear find the parents arguing over whose fault it is that the kid's lost and decide they're gonna go and find the kid. But in the end, what they really need to do is talk to the parents um, and sort of remind them that yes, this is sad and yes, this is hard on everybody, but um, They've got to also remember that there's a kid here who's maybe struggling with how difficult this is and who does this kid talk to and so um, which kind of mirrors what they're going through as well and i think i have inked this page already too so i have an inked version of it um, and i'm working with a colorist now and we've colored that page as well so this is some uh, vip sneak peeks for the <laughs> texas librarians that's right yeah uh, and folks, if you have any questions for Kim or Jared, feel free to type them into the chat window uh, and we'll be happy to discuss with you guys. Um, Kim, your characters are sort of pushing uh, teenager dumb a little bit. And they're uh, the main the two main girls, uh, Sam and Jade, are the same age uh, and they're sort of navigating that transition where they're starting to think about boys or they're starting to um reckon with those issues and jared you have two siblings who are different ages um so i wonder if you guys wanted to reflect on uh developmental uh ages and what kind of readers are really responding to your books um jared i think yours is maybe skewed a little bit younger than the surfside mm -hmm. girls um and how, how has that been like? What did you have in mind when you created it? And what have you been surprised by? Or what have you found when you meet readers? Um, I, I can talk about that um, from, from my point of view for Sam and Jade. Um, I specifically remember um, you know, entering junior high and that, that for me, it was seventh, eighth grade. And it's, you know, there's so much, 12 year olds have, like they're in such an interesting period of time in their lives because there are some on this end of the spectrum that are very, very adult. And there are some on this end of the spectrum that are still very, very children. And then you put them all in a school together and it just, it just, it gets wild. I remember having the greatest group of girlfriends at that time because we were all navigating lockers and classes and changing classes. And like, we all remember this, right? Like, and, and your body changing and then boys and, and then trying to learn, but it wasn't like the safety of your, your fifth grade or sixth grade classroom. So, so much of this is going on. And, and the way I have dealt with it is that Jade is way more interested in, in growing up. And Sam is way more interested in, I mean, she's got a good life. She's got a, a beach family and she just likes the ocean and and she's very creative and in her head. And, and why do we have to do this? Why can't things just stay the same? So um, that that's how I that's how I explore that difference. I just have a funny story. When I was painting book one, my kid was doing junior lifeguards uh, down at Seal Beach. And because it was a three hour thing, I would drive down in my Honda CRV, I'd pop the trunk, sit in my beach chair and paint 
um, to get pages done. And I would listen to these 12 year olds and they had this conversation this one time and they're standing right outside my, you know, on the beach, outside my car and I can hear them. And they're going, oh my gosh, why do we have belly buttons? Oh, look at your belly button. It's so weird. My button, it's not weird. And, and they couldn't figure out why they had belly buttons. And I am just writing all this down because I mean, it is golden to listen to um, young people at that age just have so much like humor that they don't even know about. They're, they're learning, they're understanding, they're exploring. Yeah, I think it's delightful. Yeah, and I, I would say for Red Panda and Moon Bear, it seems to have hit the hardest with readers in grades three through five. Um, I would say that those seem to be the kids who like it the most and respond the most to it. Um, I forget what we aged it at on the, on the cover, but third graders. Yeah, that's about graders. right. Yeah, okay, yeah. And so um, uh, those are the kids who seem to like it the most. Um, one of the things, so Red Panda and Moon Bear are different ages. Red Panda is slightly older than Moon Bear, but we never, there's no age given to the kids in the book. And so, because they're cartoon characters and they're not drawn to necessarily resemble human anatomy, I feel like there's a little bit of wiggle room there in the way that animation can kind of get away with not exactly pinning down the age of the kids. Um, but it was definitely, um, I wanted the book to be available to be read by all elementary school kids, but I wanted to be able to tackle also some older and, and some, some more mature issues. Um, and they are also, they're kids who fight, so they punch bad guys. I think in book one, they actually vanquish a villain entirely um, off panel, but they do. And I wanted it to be a book where, um, if you were a superhero and there was a monster, you might have to defeat this monster. Um, and uh, and I didn't want to moralize necessarily to kids, but I wanted to also sort of find that that line. And I think Lee, we, we talked about even like, can I show this ice cream monster being, this mutated ice cream cone being, being sliced on panel? Should it be off panel? Like what's the, um, uh, which as a creator, right, we, I think we ask questions about what are our obligations and our responsibilities to these age groups. Um, but ultimately I wanted it. It's one of these weird things where I want parents to buy it for their kids, but I want the kids to like it too. And so um, sort of skirting that, navigating that line there between, you know, how ferocious, how fearsome, um, how frightening can these stories be while at the same time um, seeming like they're exciting and that they're doing something new for kids. And so, uh, I, so it's a fine line. There's, there's no, it, it's not necessarily a, a story that, um, is responding to, there's, it, there aren't necessarily gendered storylines. There's not a, a specific age group. The kids are sort of in a, in a school that's just called a school and so not elementary or middle school. And so I think it's got some range there for kids. Um, but I was also really trying to also be cognizant of the fact that we have kids in middle school who like to read stories like these also. And so I didn't want it to feel like if you were in sixth or seventh grade or eighth grade, but you liked cartoon stories and you liked animation that you, you wouldn't feel like this was a book for you too, because it is. And so, um, uh, but probably my favorite reader comment came from a boy in third grade. I was doing a school visit and he said that his favorite part of the book was that Moon Bear, the little boy, um, was kind and liked animals because he said that so rarely, even in superhero stories, does he get a sort of like gentle boy character. Um, and when I was in third grade, I was definitely an animal loving, um, perhaps slightly sensitive boy. And so I would have responded very well to Moon Bear. And so, um, I don't know, I guess I wanted to make characters that, um, that felt real, but were themselves kind of fantastic and larger than life also. I'm trying to find the one where he takes care of the kitties. Yeah, that's in chapter one, towards the end here. They, they save some kittens from the two bad dogs. Even in chapter one actually is a really great example because um, when I was finishing, I, I'll never forget when I was finishing this book, I was going to read chapter one to a first grade class and um, the, the school told me I couldn't read it because it was too, uh, I forget what word they said. It wasn't appropriate for that age group. And I was like, what, what's inappropriate about this book? And I could, and so I was very, I was hyper aware of like, how do we have a story in which kids are super powered beings and fighting monsters that's not, that's being true to that genre and true to kids and what they like, but simultaneously not moralizing to them either or, um, and maybe not sort of crossing any kinds of lines or anything, so. 
It's so much easier well, as a parent. You, I, just... I was gonna say, I think you navigated that solution really well. This is the climax of chapter one where uh, the kids have, they do have a sort of cartoon battle with the bad dogs. They do. Uh, but then have this conversation where they, they get the bad dogs to open up and say, you know, we've, we, we've repeatedly escaped from shelters or, you know, nobody wants to adopt us. And then uh, Red Panda and Moon Bear uh, decide to provide a home for them. And it's a really touching moment. And they end up becoming major characters. They do, yeah. And, and I think part family. of the, yeah, and I think part of the ethos of this book largely is that everybody has a place. And it's where the tension is about how can we find and make space for everyone? And so that's how Red Panda and Moon Bear typically approach their sort of neighborhood. The way that they keep their neighborhood safe is that they find spaces for everyone to exist together. And so um, they would never vanquish a being if they didn't have to. And the monster they defeat is not actually a sentient creature. It's just a mutated ice cream cone. Um, but even still, um, you know, they felt they they felt bad about it too, and I and I wanted them to have a moment where they reflect on that too, where they're like, "Oh, that should we have done that, or was that the right way to do this?" And so, um, because they're kids too, and kids, I think, respond like everybody, right? We respond by emotionally sometimes, logically other times, um, and we have to also um, reflect on the consequences of our decisions. So, I have a pivot to suggest to ask him something based on what Jared was talking about, uh, this idea of everybody has a place. Uh, you know, you guys were talking earlier about the importance of place in your work. And Kim, one of the things that I love so much about the Surfside Girls series as a whole is the way that it is so grounded in place. Uh, and it's a way that like, is like it's literally about Southern California, but it applies to every place that like, every place that people live has a history to it and is a sort of overlapping set of cultures and communities over time. So can you think, talk about some of the thinking that went into that with Absolutely. your first two books? Um, this, is, this is huge for me. And like I said, this is this two friends solving mysteries, but deep underneath, and hopefully people get this organically and it's not preachy, but like the land is eternal. I love Southern California. This land is eternal and it has been through so many iterations, um, held by so many different people and passed through by so many different people. Um, and, and so when I was crafting Danger Point, which is, which is kind of a place called Contina Point in Laguna Beach, um, kind of the sanctuary. And what I decided was this was a like a paradise where if you had died and you lived in Southern California, you didn't feel like moving on yet because why would you, it's gorgeous here. Um, you could just hang at Danger Point. And when Sam swims through the cave and comes up the cliff and and now that's what she's done. She's come through a little hole in the, in the, in the cave underneath. And she sees this, she, she sees ghosts and that's scary. And then Jade can't see the ghost because Jade isn't brave enough to swim through this underwater tunnel. Um, but what we don't know immediately is it why, who these ghosts are. And these ghosts are the history of California. So you've got Native American ghosts. And in book two, you can see the little Native American boys and their rabbit, Tuvit, which is the Tongva word for rabbit. I did a lot of research on my local tribe here, which is the, um, uh, the Native American tribe here is the Tongva. Um, and I have a funny story about that or crazy story about that. But anyway, uh, in the foreground, you've got like vaqueros and people from the Rancho period when, which is, a, that's why I, when I dug into history for book one, I thought, oh, note to self. The Rancho period of Southern California history is fascinating. And I'm lucky that I have three different ranchos in very close driving distance. And I went and sat with a lot of historians to try to get like what, you know, onion peel back this land. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, there was, a, there was a day that I was researching book one and I had just, I mean, this is the strangest thing. I teach at Cal State Long Beach and it's not easy to find information about the native tribes, which is sad because they're not very populous. There's just not a lot of people and there's not a lot of online presence. So, I finally found out the native tribe is called Tongva. Where is where was their main city? Cal State Long Beach. It was called Pavugna. And, <clears throat> and so I went for a walk on my campus. There's a parking lot and there's an area of Cal State Long Beach that the native Americans will not let be developed, which is great. Um, and walking through there, there's a lot of oak trees and they've got prayer flags. 
and shells, offerings of shells like underneath the trees. And I, I just wanted to sit with the land for a little bit and, and kind of feel like this is what I'm trying to put into this book underneath it all. Like, what is this land? And, 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 and it will be here long after we decide what we call it, right? Um, and so as I'm, as I'm standing there, I look down and there's a paw print. And when I look up, there's two coyotes staring at me about 30 feet away. And I thought, I think they're there for a reason. And so I'm just gonna slowly look down and kind of back up and, and I wasn't scared of them, but I thought I've never seen coyotes in the daytime just staring at me. And um, I backed up and backed up and uh, ended up, you know, or, uh, on one of the closer to the parking lot oak trees. And when I looked up, one of the coyotes was laying down and one of them was taking a poop. So I thought, I think I passed, I think I'm okay. And then I've, you know, I've learned that this land is protected and there's guardians, but all of this came into my head in, in book two here. Um, the, the book starts because uh, Maria is this highly dramatic Mexican ghost. And she was actually, we come to find out, the daughter who lived at this expansive rancho. She was like a little princess and she's highly dramatic. And uh, there's a spark of jealousy because one of the ghosts that Sam likes, uh, she's turning to him. And, but, but what's happened is that she thinks that she's seen her father alive, inhuman, on the beach and that can't be because she's been dead for how long right and her father had mysteriously disappeared and so the girls dig into this history of like who was her father they come to find out that this was her land and um she is able to take their hands when they're at this rancho which is in disrepair right now and when she takes their hands it looks like the days back when the yankees would sail around cape horn and or, and and come up uh, and trade with California, um, which was part of Mexico, but sort of kind of its own thing. And there is so much fascinating history that came up in this. When the girls go to research more of theirs, they're tracking down like who would take an injured man in and they found out that the ranchos would take an injured man in. And I, when I went to my local mission, um, San Juan Capistrano and, and did a lot of research there, um, I found a library of these great old books and some of the, the learning I did just by talking to the historians, like for instance, that for a very, very long time, people thought California was an island and it was drawn on maps into the 1600s as an island. Um, so all this history, I kind of stuffed little bits of that into book two as I learned these things. Um, I, like I said, I do really love Southern California. It's kind of in my soul. And, um, and, and on that really quickly, I'm a Marine brat. So my dad traveled all over the, the world and I was the first child, so I got dragged. But I always had this thought that we would come home and Southern California was always home to me. And I think that's where this started. Um, so anyway, that's, that's sort of how California has come to play a really strong part and the history of it, like the levels of history um, play a part into. And then, and then book three here, where I dive into, even though Surfside's a fictitious town, kind of conglomerated between Laguna Beach and San Clemente and Seal Beach, um, I populate it with our local um, Southern California flora and fauna. Awesome. And hopefully it'll, you know, inspire readers to think about the local histories of their own place and realize that wherever you are, somebody else was there before you and understanding that sort of legacy uh, is something that we can all benefit from and, and, understand our, our place in the world a little bit better. Absolutely. As well as learn uh, the formula for wavelength. <laughs> uh, Jared, what do you want to tease the librarians with for book two in your series? Yeah, so book two, um, if you've read book one, you know that it dropped a lot of sort of Easter eggs or sort of hints about the fact that the town and where they live might be um, sort of more magical and more mysterious than it seemed at first. And so um, uh, book two uh, goes deeper into the town itself and what makes this place magical. Um, and similar to, uh, I, I think one of the things that you, as you were talking, Kim, about the history sort of revealing it Itself through characters. It was reminding me that, you know, I'm a uh, kind of second generation Cuban American, but first generation born here in the United States. And I have kids now. And for the first time ever, like Cuban Americans, we have 
a couple of generations born and raised here, which has never, right? When I was growing up as a kid, we were sort of discovering, you know, anew, but now like I'm getting to sort of pass my memories of born, being born and raised here onto my, and, and being here in the land and being in this space physically onto my kids. And so, um, uh, so I like the idea that um, engaging with place is not just a, a geographic activity, but also a narrative activity in which we're sort of revealing the stories of what came before us and of the people who came before us. And so um, book two does a little bit more of that, this revealing the sort of mysterious historical origins of this town and of this neighborhood specifically. Um, uh, and so that's, so we'll learn some things. In book one, there's a shadowy figure who seems to have some kind of role uh, relevant to the kids and their magic abilities and so in book two we we'd learn who the magical who the um shadowy figure is and what his role is um we learn a little bit more about the secret organization that had been in the town called the um institute for anomalous behavior which was running these sort of secret underground laboratories that were, are now defunct but the kids um, are able to kind of get some of them back online and start to figure out what they were doing in this town and why they were there um, and so we get to reveal some of these mysterious origins which has been really fun i get to bring back characters from book one which is maybe one of the most exciting and unexpected things that i i you know it seems obvious of course you bring back secondary characters but when you introduce a character you get to spend so few time so little time with them and bringing them back when you're not giving their origin story means you really get to see them sort of grow and turn into real characters which is a lot of fun too so did you bring yeah. back your yeti the I yeti him. does i love the yeti yeah he doesn't come back but the ghost in the library there's a haunted library in book one um and uh the ghost in that library comes back uh she's the former librarian whose great granddaughter is the current librarian and so the the former librarian as a ghost comes back and helps the kids out so jerry do we think uh get somebody else joining us do we think that the tla uh librarians could have a little sneak peek at the cover to book two sure yeah so you want me to pull it up? Announced you? this one, yeah. I can if. I yeah, yeah. It here. Yeah. All right. It's got. Uh, so the the title is "The Curse of the Evil Eye," which I think you talked about a little bit already. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this cover. <laughs> yeah. So this cover, this this is the evil eye. This is Mal de Ojo. Um, this sort of creature, this uh, kind of living curse. Now. He's not really Mal de Ojo from like the Cuban culture, but this is how the kids understand him to be based on what he looks like and what he's doing in this town. He's acting and functioning a lot like what they understand Mal de Ojo to be. So they call him Mal de Ojo and they think he's that. And so he's sort of cornering the kids in the alleyway here. We've got Moonbear has his magical gauntlet. Um, the two dogs are back uh, and uh, they're gonna have to address this, uh, this being. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't wanna give away uh, too many spoilers, but um, yeah, they will eventually have to turn around and confront this guy. We have another little ghost hiding in the building off to the There's a here. ghost hiding in the window, and uh, that ghost is uh, throughout book two, and um, yeah, will eventually come to play a really important part of the story, too. <laughs> but of course, uh, like all of your villains, Mal de Ojo here is not quite what he seems. Uh, and I think you have a really fun climax set up where once again, like the power, the ultimate superpower that I think Red Panda and Moonbear have is empathy, you know, and the, the particularly, I think Moonbear, the younger boy uh, has such a sort of tender heart, like you were talking about earlier, he loves animals and he often will be the one to suggest, hey, maybe we can find a gentler way to do this or maybe this person's right. just misunderstood. Yeah, and I think, you know, what what Red Panda and Moonbear ultimately have to always discover about their villains that they're fighting is that there's a story behind who this villain is and what they yeah. want. Full eye. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and so, you know, defeating a villain is very rarely, you know, uh, 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 about punching or slicing a villain with weapons, um, but it's usually about having to figure out what it is that this villain wants and why they want it. And so a creature that's motivated by jealousy and envy um, 
uh, the kids discover that empathy and care is a strong antidote to that sort of thing. Something we could all stand to learn, maybe. Uh, for those yeah. of you just joining us, we're talking to Kim Dwinell and Jared Rossello, authors of a uh, wonderful graphic novel series uh, for older elementary uh, readers in particular uh, from Top Shelf and IDW Publishing. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to chime into the chat, uh, or if you're just joining us, you can share uh, where you're coming from and what community you're uh, serving with your amazing library work that you're doing in this strange time where a lot of libraries are still closed and uh, all of our work is is pivoting in strange new directions that we didn't expect. Um, how have you guys, uh, what lessons have you learned from, from the year of pandemic as a teacher or as a cartoonist? Um, I, I can start, I can start this. I, I know um, I'm, I'm very tactile and um, teaching, teaching these two classes back to back on Zoom and trying to connect with students is so, is so difficult. You know, for instance, you know, I, we do character design and I say, instead of saying with my, my tracing paper over the top of their uh, drawing as I'm in the classroom, no, put the arm more like this. It's, it's like, okay, let me screenshot it and drag it down into Photoshop and let me draw on it. And then I'm going to screenshot that and reshare it with you. And, and the process is so hard and difficult. And, uh, but students have stepped up and they're amazing and they're not, they're not being gypped. They're learning just as much. Um, and I have so much respect for the generation, my college generation, that's just saying, you know, this is what it is. I think this generation's really good at saying that this is what it is and we're just going to deal with it. And, and, and the rock stars carrying on like they are. So I've been really inspired. Um, every time I, I have this Zoom fatigue and I sit down in front of it, they're so passionate and inspired that it helps me keep going. Yeah, it's been um, a challenging year to be a teacher <laughs> um, and a parent uh, simultaneously. And so um, I, I think I, I applied the lessons that I learned as an artist, which is one of the things that I like about making comics. All, every art form is, constra is constraint-based. Comics is also really good at kind of showing what its constraints are, right? Like I have so many panels, I'm using these materials, that kind of thing. Um, and I learned early on that in, in comics that I was a better cartoonist when I worked with my materials, including things like time and attention than against them. And so uh, part of my strategy to making it through this last year has been working with, again, my constraints and with my materials, including like, fatigue, exhaustion, um, uh, low morale. And so rather than sort of pushing against myself, just sort of accepting, okay, this is where I'm at. This is how I'm feeling. What can I make with what I'm doing right now and how I'm feeling right now and what, what I'm capable of and what I have access to. And then having these conversations with my students also, because you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling this way, so are they. And it turns out they are. So and so um, I think giving ourselves that sort of space to kind of think a little more um, uh, innovatively about what we're doing and what we can do and what we can work with has resulted in me uh, getting my students getting uh, getting the best out of them um, and still let, having them do things but requires a lot of modification on my part, which I'm fine and happy to do. And so, um, but it's also reflected in my art practice too. I think it's been hard to do sort of long sustained work. And so I've been reading a lot of short novels and reading short stories. And so um, sometimes I have collections of flash fiction and sometimes, you know, that feeling you get when you finish something and you can read a flash piece in one sitting and it sort of sustains me as a reader and as a, and as a writer. And so I think, again, trying to think about what are my materials and I include things like time and attention and sensations and feelings as part of the larger kind of material assemblage of being an artist and just living in the world right now and try to work with those things and so you know you brought yeah. up a good point I, I think grit is something that I discuss with my students too and it's really it's really hard um but you know when I worked in animation like I was on Mulan and I was on on Hercules and an end of a film you're working seven days a week and and it's just grit and that's an important lesson to learn for any visual artist and so so grit being able to sit in the chair and like yeah maybe we're at the end and and we're not seeing many people but make hay while the sun shines you have a time and a space you know that you 
can get things done. And when we open up for comic conventions, I tell my students, have stuff to show, have, you know, have a productive year of this, even though it's difficult. Um, you know, we are, as artists, sort of already set up for this. We spend a lot of time here at the desk alone. And so we just kind of have to dive into that happy world that we've got um, in order to do that. Um, like I said, I spent a lot of time looking at ocean videos. <laughs> like I had, when I was doing book three, I had the Monterey Bay Aquarium has like a live cam and I'd put the kelp forest on <laughs> and it's delightful. I'm watching fish go by. And I thought this is, this is what, like I have to fill up, fill up, fill up and push this all into my book uh, so that, so that my readers get this warmth, this sunniness, this happiness that comes out of um, Southern California. Uh, Jared, you said something about um, short chunks, uh, short stories and so on. And I wonder if that's something that you guys have thought about as you're doing the graphic novel structured the way that you are. You know, do you think of these as chapter books in some sense? Uh, and when you write uh, a graphic novel, do you think of it in short chapters that can be sort of satisfying one session? Okay, then put it down and pick it up later. Keep going. Yeah, I think, you know, Red Pain and Moon Bear set up in 11 chapters. Each book is 11 chapters. Every chapter is a standalone story, kind of start to finish. Um, and the last two chapters are a sort of double feature <laughs> conclusion to that. Um, but that working in those small chunks has, it's always actually been really helpful to me. Um, it's sort of, again, when I talk about working with who I am as a person rather than against it, um, I was never the kind of teacher who could plan like multi-week lessons. Like I just, my brain just worked better in small pieces where we start and we finish something today together while we're, to, while we're here now. And so I think um, making comics is so great for that too, because you can start a panel and finish it and you finish something. It's not a piece of something, it's a whole panel and it's done. Um, and so comics has been a medium that's been really helpful in that regards and then also structuring my stories <clears throat> in small bits I also like to like add things in that I don't know what they are and have to figure them out later down the road it keeps storytelling fun for me and so I get to draw something into a background in one panel and then two chapters later I have an idea oh that thing I drew in the background I can bring it back now or I have an explanation for what it is <clears throat> and so I think working in fragments and segments um, helps me stay productive and still make things and is some, is, a, is a form of, of, of art making that um, uh, that seems to work well with comics and with cartooning like you don't have to kind of you know go start to finish all the way through it doesn't have to be a 300 page you know single narrative you can chop it up you can break it up and you can sort of decide even when I'm drawing I go foreground drawings first and then maybe mid and then maybe backgrounds and so there's so many ways I think to divide up the work where it doesn't feel overwhelming <clears throat> if I can talk on that for a minute I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share myself again um because you know I had to I had to do things differently this time um and, and I'm trying to push science on kids. And I know that like, I have a real arty brain and I never did really well in math and science, like I probably would have gone into science if I thought I could handle the math, but I knew I couldn't handle math. And, and so what I tried to do with my book here is I tried to provide a lot of white space around these concepts that I was pushing. So like, you know, those DK books where, you know, where they're about musical instruments and they have these cutouts and they have lots of white space and they've just got the instruments on the page. That sort of guided me. And I thought I want to keep it open and airy in a way that um, kids can uh, get the concept. This one's a little bit more, it's a little fuller. But like I said, when I was watching these ocean videos, I was watching things about bait balls. But uh, on a full blade image like this, I, I try to give these lots of uh, time and space and not a lot of verbiage so that you could, like there's a chapter on physics, there's a chapter on biology, there's a ch chapter on being a good ocean steward. There's actually a chapter on how to surf, but they could be read independently and they're full of white space and uh, not a ton of text, a lot of visuals. And that's what would have helped me understand these con concepts at that age. And I, I probably would have ended up in marine biology if I knew that I could, I could get through the concepts without necessarily all that math. And I work with a scientist at Cal State Long Beach, uh, Dr. Chris Lowe, who, who runs the Shark Lab. And he, he tells me, he's like, not all scientists are great at math. It's 
creative thinking. It's there's a lot more to it. And you know, no one told me that. So I tried to structure this book so so people like me who were interested in science but didn't feel they had the math skills to keep up could get something out of it and potentially take this to a new level, maybe become a marine biologist themselves. That's fantastic. Um, uh, I wonder if you guys want to uh, broaden the conversation a little bit. Are there graphic novels by other folks that you've uh, had on your radar lately that um, got you really excited uh, to keep doing your work or uh, that you would want to recommend to the librarians watching? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. I've got a stack of, of books that I've been reading lately that I'm happy to recommend uh, that I really like. Um, one is Romaina Yee's Seance Tea Party. Um, it's also about ghosts too, Kim. And so uh, it's a, about a girl who brings her imaginary friend back after a long hiatus, except it turns out she's a ghost and was a ghost the whole time. And so uh, that's one that I've been liking a lot. It's also visually structured in really interesting ways on the page. And so um, it's kind of fun to play with these, just even just like each page is like an illustration to talk about sort of how the narrative moves across the page. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I've got, I can recommend a ton of <laughs> books I've been liking right now, but I don't know, Kim, if you have some that you've been- I, I'll be honest, I haven't had a ton of time for reading and I've been, re what I have been reading is prose, but I will say I'm super excited about Campbell White's um, second installation of Home Time because I think that's out soon and I don't have it. Um, oh, I don't know oh when, no. yeah, it's out. Is it uh, out? I, I do not that. have that. And I, I really have been head down until about last month, I was head down in this book and not really reading, yes, not really reading much at all. Uh, but I can pull home time off my shelf here if you don't have the first one. Um, yeah, these are monsters, yeah, yeah. but they're so, so beautiful. He's Australian and, and crazy in his ability to switch between art styles. And it's a very strange and in the same way that Dr. Seuss is both for kids and just slightly dark, um, I feel like it has that same thing. It has that, that slight teeth to it uh, that makes it uh, not everything could always work out. And so I, I, I really like his writing and I really like his artwork. So I look forward to getting book two. I just took a trip to the library and stocked up on some books also. So I'll, I'll shout out some of my library finds recently. The first two are two top shelf books. Hi, One hi. is The Grot, the Grot by Pat Grant, which I've loved Pat's work forever. Also Australian, um, this is for more mature readers. Um, but I love, I love Pat's kind of cartoony and slightly grotesque style. Um, the way that sort of draws everything, it's sort of, everybody looks kind of sticky and gross and the stories are <laughs> just so very human and in our sort of like body, in, in the most sort of bodied sense and that we're like bodied beings walking through the world. Um, and then uh, I just grabbed Glork Patrol also by James Kachalka, who's probably one of one of the one of my earliest largest influences as a cartoonist, somebody whose work I really loved, and uh, his American Elf. He, uh, he, he manages to stay five years old and an adult at the same time. I don't understand how. Yeah, and then I'll just shout out two more books if if if, if that's okay. Um, one is the second Bug Boys, which is again a, a kind of a short story collection. Um, and it's each chapter is a sort of standalone story, but it's so strange and unusual. And it's just about these two best friends who are both Beatles um, and they go on sort of strange kind of magical adventures. Um, and the last is probably one of my favorites that's come out recently, which is the Aster series. This is the most recent one, Aster and the Mixed Up Magic. It's very sort of like Hilda, a girl and her family kind of relocate to a magical setting. And she has to kind of figure out how to live in this sort of magical place where there's like sort of magical creatures and other animals and things like that. But I really like the art style because I feel like it's it's kind of similar to mine. Uh, and so <laughs> sometimes when I'm drawing a book, I like to kind of be reading stuff that's similar to mine because I feel like it encourages me and excites me. And also in those moments when I get stuck kind of reminds me of what it is that I loved about comics in the first place and why I came to make these stories, which is um, helpful at times, so. You know, it's funny because I'm absolutely the opposite. When I'm crafting my stories, I don't want other influences in my head. Like I have to mm -hmm. like, very clearly have my vision and I don't want to see that stuff while I'm creating and then I binge it like all summer when I'm not on a book and I'm like ah, I can finally read but I, I can't have other people's voices in my head while I'm creating 
Yeah, there are times where I'm like, I, I'm stuck in like a narrative issue and I can't figure out how to solve this. And I'm like, I know the answer is in an Adventure Time episode. And so I'll just go and I'll watch it. And I'm like, there it is. That's how I need that weird noodle arm to do this. And then I can, I can figure out how to structure these panels. Noodle perfect. arms. So, yeah. 